in South Africa. Uh, but as we know, South Africa has been in the news quite a bit. Uh, number of a number of different topics. You know, three really jump out of the headlines. One is this uh, land confiscation. We're going to talk about that. The idea of confiscating the land of white farmers in South Africa. The second is um, the idea that there is white genocide out there is an idea that is spread by the alt-right and others on the right uh, that are convinced that whites are dropping like flies all over the South Africa. So we'll dig a little bit into the numbers and see if that is true. And then um, the water crisis in uh, Cape Town. Uh, supposedly, Cape Town is going to run out of water any day now, I guess, uh, sometime in the, in the next few months. There's literally going to be no water. The taps are going to go dry. Um, a real a real drought in a major city. I don't think it's ever happened uh, before. Uh, to talk about these issues uh, with regard to South Africa, I've got uh, Christo, and I'm not going to try to pronounce your family name. That's okay. Thank you for having me on your own. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> My pleasure. And uh, Chris, uh, Christo is a researcher at the Free Market Foundation of South Africa, so a free market think tank. He has been a student at the Objectivist Academic Center and uh, an, an objectivist. Uh, he's on Facebook and uh, Twitter and, uh, and so on. And he writes quite a bit for the Free Market Foundation on issues related to South Africa. So let's, let's start, Christo, maybe talk a little bit about this uh, land confiscation. I mean, there was a lot of press here in the U.S., and I think it somewhat misrepresented the issue because the way it was presented here is that Parliament had voted to approve the confiscation of land uh, of white farmers by the government with no compensation. Mm -hmm. uh, so eminent domain, but no compensation. So let's first is, you know, let's go through the process because that's not accurate. What has actually happened and what is yet to happen? All right, so in our constitution in section 25, we have our property rights clause. Um, and that's the focus of this whole expropriation without compensation thing. That's what we're calling it. Um, at the beginning of March, the ANC, the African National Congress, that's in the majority party in our parliament, they and the EFF, the Economic Freedom Fighters, they introduced a motion to amend Section 25 of our constitution to allow for land expropriation without compensation. Um, I think constitutionally speaking, it's already in our constitution that you can seize land, that the states can seize land if they provide enough compensation to the owner. Yeah. But now the EFF have gained popularity in the country. They're more left-wing than the ANC. And with our elections coming up next year, I think the ANC are trying to get as many votes in as possible. Uh, land is a sensitive topic in African societies, especially with colonialism and uh, land invasions and all that sort of thing. So the ANC is moving more left now. Uh, and in order to get some votes, they're telling people, well, you know, vote for us and allow us to amend the constitution and we'll give you X, Y, Z. Uh, there's a constitutional review committee that's been appointed. Um, they'll come back at the end of August and sort of brief parliament as to whether the constitution needs to be amended or not. Um, just this last week, I attended a land summit in Johannesburg. It was attended by media and uh, pol pol political parties and analysts. And two members of parliament from the ANC themselves said that it's not a given that the constitution will be amended. Uh, they're investigating the whole thing. They're trying to see, you know, what the process will be. But we shouldn't all panic. Um, I think the ANC is realizing from foreign investors that maybe this is not such a good idea, um, you know, that they need to be more careful. So they're backtracking in some areas. So we'll see. It's it's a bit up in the air. In the air. But at least they're, I can say they're softening a bit in their rhetoric. So we'll see. And we'll know that by the end of August? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And, and so let's go through this. So first, I mean, every constitution pretty much out there allows for the government, unfortunately, to seize land with compensation. I mean, the American constitution allows that through eminent domain. And uh, it sounds like the South African constitution allows it for the public good. The government can seize land as long as it compensates mm -hmm. uh, its owner. So I think from an objectivist perspective, we reject that idea wholeheartedly. Government should have no right to seize right. land under any conditions, even if they pay you quadruple the market price. It's not an issue mm -hmm. of price. It's an issue of principle. Your land right. is your land and, and should not be seized. Um, to what extent have, have, as the government in the past, tried to uh, kind of buy uh, farmland owned by whites in order to mm -hmm. transition it to hand it over to blacks? 
I think in some areas of the country since 1994, since our first democratic elections, the government has done it and it has been successful when they've handed over title deeds. So they've given the right of the property to the, you know, the black farm owner so he can actually use it and put the land to use. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't help having land if it's not actually under your name, then you can never be productive in it and you can never do anything with it. Um, but I think part of why it's becoming such a hot topic now is because the process has been slow. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of pressure on government to deliver services such as water, electricity. And now people assume if you have a piece of land, you'll be affluent and wealthy and, you know, you'll, you'll increase your personal wealth and you'll be able to trade and all that sort of thing. So it's sort of a get out of jail free card. Yeah. They assume if they give land, then you know black people will be in, you know necessarily better off without giving them the skills or the monetary aid or anything like that. Um, so in some areas it's been good, but it's it's slow as government tends to be, which is why I think it's becoming such a hot button issue. So it strikes me that it would be good in places where the farmers have cultivated the land. The land is owned by nobody or owned by the state. Right. And get a deed on it. So I, I think that's an issue of justice, and I think. Uh, and I think that's what's going on a little bit in Soweto right now with the, with the mayor of Johannesburg. He's giving deeds to people who already have squatted on the land, but it's government land. They're not stealing right. it from any, anybody. Uh, but what, what is being proposed now is literally taking the land from white farmers because they have too much mm -hmm. and, and giving that land to, uh, to blacks. So what, what is the justification given uh, for that? Is it, is it the whole issue of colonialism? It's partly that. I think it's also partly the inequality issue where, you know, you assume that because someone has land, therefore he is wealthy. It doesn't really matter what he does with it. I guess that's sort of a, um, you know, I guess that's Marx's uh, influence coming in. So, you know, just, you know, the landowner, the workers of the land don't actually get anything. It's the, the white owner of the farm who takes all the profits and that sort of thing. But with the economic freedom fighters now, with them introducing this motion to amend the constitution, I mean, they're the left the left, most left-wing party we have, they've said that the state will be the custodian of all land. So this includes houses, flats, oh, you know, urban property. It's not just um, agricultural land. It's not private land. It, yeah. They abolish basically private, yeah. private property completely. Yeah. Which wow. we're, trying to, we're trying to bring to sort of public attention because it's not just a case of white-owned farms. It's going to be no blacks, no black people, no white people can own land, which, you know, black people, their land was taken by the British and Afrikaners and so we're trying to sort of get them to see the gains we've made under democracy and the constitution and property rights and not roll back on all of that stuff. So, so a couple of things. To what extent is the motivation of the EFF versus racist? Is it a racist motivation? Mm. Or to what extent is it a Marxist motivation or is it a combination of both? I think it's a combination of both. Um, their leader, Julius Malema, he was part of the ANC, but he was kicked out. So he sort of decided to go full left wing to sort of, you know, throw up, uh, you know, sort of a sign to them that either they follow him or, you know, they're going to lose their base, their support. Um, he's repeatedly said that, you know, the, that the white farmer must be killed. Uh, Afri uh, um, Europeans must go back to Europe. You know, he's um, he said things for which one could be convicted of sort of hate speech. And we do have a hate speech bill coming soon. Um, so he might be he might need to be a bit more careful with what he says. I don't think he realizes what he's doing. Um, but I think for him, it's a, it's a case of just garnering support and trying to grow his party. And, you know, as with a lot of left-wing politicians, it's about political expediency and practicality and, you know, just getting support and the consequences be damned. But is there a, is there a sense among, among Africans in, uh, that, um, is there, is there a, 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 a racist streak among blacks in South Africa that he is feeding off of? Because if, I, I think I think that the media will tend to over hype that racist that there's this racial tension between South Africans. Okay. Uh, the Institute of Race Relations they do annual surveys on on relations between different race groups and, for example, in their latest one, I think the issue of land was 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 not either or any of the top three of the most pressure, pressing issues for Black South Africans. So I think that they do realize that, it's, you know, because a white person has X, it doesn't mean that that's why they don't have X. Um, I think that they are, they tend to be suspicious of the government, especially because the government isn't delivering, which is now why the ANC and EFF are trying to be more radical. Sure. Um, I think that racial tensions are overhyped um, and that he, 
he's trying to tap into something and make more of it than than there is. So it's it, it would you say that it's more the Marxist element, the kind of the leftist element, than yes. the racial element? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, you know it's easy for the government to blame, to have a target to blame instead of their own in- inefficiencies and um, inability to the to deliver anything. So well, and they've been a statist government for I mean forever. You know, since yeah. since they came into power, they didn't yeah. see. Um, so, uh, what is your what is your expectation of what will actually happen with the uh, with the land expropriation? Um, as an objectivist, I guess maybe it's a, maybe it's a, <laughs> maybe it's false hope, but I am cautiously optimistic that uh, come the end of August that the, the review committee will come back and tell us Good. it's already in the constitution. Uh, we don't have to radically amend things. Maybe they'll put in a temporary measure. Uh, that'll have to pass constitutional master. And again, it's up to our constitutional court, which does sometimes tend to go on the more radical interpretation of the constitution. Uh, we tend to think of our constitution as guaranteeing that the state must provide, you know, basic services, they yeah. must provide education, healthcare, all that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful. Uh, it's been a transparent process so far. I think they realize that that they could scare investors away. Um, and just now that Jacob Zuma was was kicked out and Cyril Ramaphosa came in, we've seen an increase uh, in in foreign investment. The stock market is doing better. Okay. Um, the rand has strengthened. So I think the ANC realized they need to be very careful with what little progress that they're making now. Uh, there's also been talk that they want to um, they want to move the elections closer to the beginning of 2019 to you know sort of make. Um, Sort of make hay while the sun is shining, sure. uh, so that they can get more votes. So we'll see. Um, is this president helpful. is this president a significant improvement over Zuma? I mean, is uh, where does he come down? I mean, he's a former businessman at least, so he knows something about yes. business. He, he has worked in business. Um, I think he's whereas Jacob Zuma was more. You see, it's difficult because I think Zuma he spoke the communist rhetoric, but he was in it for himself. So he was corrupt and he was a crony, but he looked after himself. He didn't use the state apparatus to, you know, to actually impose communism. Okay. Whereas Ramaphosa might be a bit more of an ideologue. And, you know, that's a scary thing. Like a, an effective communist is a scary communist. You know, yes. you'd rather have a corrupt communist than, a, than an effective communist. Yeah. Um, but a lot of people are hopeful on him because he speaks better. Uh, he's more educated than Zuma, but that could be, you know, a false, sort of a false impression. Sure. So as always, we need to be vigilant and we need to hold him accountable. Okay. Um, he is more pro-business, so we'll see. A Marxist who's pro-business, that's scary. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> okay, so you're cautiously, cautiously optimistic. Now let's quickly review, you know, kind of the history of the, the the last land confiscation in that part of the world, mm-hmm. which is it was in Zimbabwe, and yes. I think um, I, you know my I had relatives in Zimbabwe when it was Rhodesia, and uh, they owned uh, a lot of land uh, up there. And uh, what happened when that land was confiscated? So Zimbabwe used to be known as the breadbasket of of Africa. Um, they exported a lot. Now they have to import pretty much everything. Uh, when they kicked uh, white farmers off their farms, you know, through force, that resulted in the complete collapse of their economy. Their inflation is through the roof. It's ridiculous. I mean, it's sort of a Venezuela type situation. Yep. Um, so it's when we make the argument again. You would think South so, Africa would learn the lesson from. You from, would think so, yeah. I mean, it's right. It's, it's close. And uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. the economy completely collapsed. They were literally starving. They had to import food. They were getting, mm-hmm. they were getting food aid from the U.S. The, the U.S. and Europe. This is the yeah. breadbasket of Africa. Because you know, when once they confiscated the the large yeah. farms, and uh, yeah, it, it, yeah. You don't think people would learn. It, mm-hmm. It's. I'm I'm sure you're aware that they've got a new president now as well. Yeah. Um, so we might, we'll see what happens in South Africa. Maybe we're, we're all going to head north, whereas Zimbabweans <laughs> used to come south but when their country collapsed. Maybe we're all South Africans are going to head north. Well, you know, if I trusted the new president of Zimbabwe, maybe I would have that hope. But I, 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 I fear that the new president might not yeah. be as corrupt as Mugabe. That, that, would take, no. that would take real effort. But I still don't think he's going to be that good, um, unfortunately. I mean, it, it's sad for the people of Zimbabwe. Okay, I want to I want to talk quickly about this issue of um, 
of white genocide, which which mm-hmm. comes up all the time among the alt right, and I see it all the time on different right wing news uh, news sites. Um, uh, Breitbart talks about this quite a bit, and then there was I think her name is Lauren Summers or something like that. She she went to South Very Africa. Southern, yeah. yeah, she visited the farms and she told the horrific stories of the murders on the farm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, to what extent is this? A real story. I mean, something obviously is going on, but but yeah. to what extent is this a real story? To what extent is it blown up? Is there white genocide going on in South Africa, and um, and 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 we can link that up with the general crime rate in South Africa. Well, to that question, no, I don't think there's a white genocide in South Africa. Um, the the attacks that happen on farms are violent because I think that most of them are racially motivated. I don't think it's necessarily from farm workers on the farms. It might just be people who are desperate, you know, that doesn't justify what they do, but they sort of see that their poor is caused by white people. And so they act out of anger and that sort of thing. Um, the majority of South Africans are black and therefore the majority of, of sort of crime committed is black on black crime. Yep. Um, and people, you know, obviously that won't sell newspapers. So, you know, they don't really want to write about that and, and that sort of thing. But I, I definitely don't think there's a white genocide. There's no, Sort of, you know, we do have high walls and that sort of thing, and but I don't think people, you know, barricade themselves in, and there's no like stockpiling of arms or that sort of thing. <laughs> so I, I think it's blown out of proportion, and um, we have more serious issues to deal with, sort of like the expropriation thing, than we do to worry about that we're gonna, you know, the different race groups are gonna start fighting each other. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've looked at some of the da- uh, at some of the data and the statistics, and the, the stuff that they report is almost always. Uh, distorted and yeah. wrong and, uh, and and taken out of context. And they 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 report, for example, that 5.2, uh, something like 5.2 farmers are killed every, mm-hmm. I can't remember what that data is, but that includes black farmers and white farmers and, yeah. you know, all, all races. It has nothing to do with whites. No. It is true that there is a large proportion that is white, but that's partially because whites are, are, are wealthy and, yeah. and uh, it's usually they're attacked and their property is stolen. Mm-hmm. It's also true that the police are probably incompetent and corrupt yes. in South Africa, and therefore uh, they're not protecting uh, people like they should. And I think, yeah. I think some of kind of the civil defense in South Africa was disbanded, particularly in the rural areas, yeah. which has caused the rise in crime over there. But the mm-hmm. fact is the crime in urban South Africa, uh, particularly in Cape Town, but all over South Africa, really in urban centers, is far greater, as you said, mm-hmm. black and black crime is far greater than it is in rural South Africa. And uh, in a, it's so high, actually. It's one of the worst countries in the world right now. Yeah. I mean, it's in, in terms of murders per 100,000, it, it, it's clearly in the top 10 countries in the world. It ranks up there with, with countries in, uh, in Central America and, mm-hmm. uh, and other parts of Africa. It really is horrific. And that's, yeah. that's, a, that's you know, though I always say in countries like that, I, I, I always say, you know, the one job of government is to protect us. The one job right. of government is to police. That's the one job of government to protect us from murder of all things. Mm-hmm. Stop everything. Shut down every other department. Stop spending any money on anything else the government is doing and spend it on, you know, on policing. Yeah. And that's how you get rid of the, the, the murder rate. But no. no, that's not what they do. And, and particularly in, in corrupt governments like the government in South Africa, they, they spend way too much of uh, of the money on other stuff and not enough on the policing side. Uh, the policing side. There was a there was an interesting report came out last I think two weeks ago about the amount of money spent on personal bodyguards for politicians and you wow. know that just goes to show you well you know they won't use the police they'll spend billions of rands on uh, on private police. You know. Talk about corruption. Yeah. Talk about corruption. I mean that they that their security is more important than the security of the people they're supposed to serve. They're right. supposed to be your servants. Not mm-hmm. our masters who walk around with with, uh, with uh, bodyguards, but our servants who provide security for all of us. Yeah, uh, it's it's a complete inversion. It's a complete inversion of the of, of the situation. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Let one more South African story uh, that I think uh, that I think will cover it, uh, and that is um, the water crisis in Cape Town. So tell yeah. us a little bit about how Cape Town. Cape Town, by the way, for those of you who've never been, probably one of the most beautiful to- cities in the world. It, it has Table Mountain right above it. It has this beautiful bay. It has fantastic beaches on, on a number of different sides. It's, 
it, if you go south of Cape Town, you can get to the point where the Indian Ocean meets the Atlantic Ocean. I mean, the whole area is spectacular. Mm-hmm. Cape Town in particular is a gorgeous, gorgeous uh, city. Uh, tell us a little bit about, um, you know, why, how this city has come to a situation where it has no water. <laughs> So to, uh, we can tie this back to the property rights thing because um, you know it's mismanagement of water resources and it's only come about. I think last year, end of last year, it, it came about that okay, well, Cape Town's going to run out of water, but no one owns the water, so who's going to take responsibility for it? Yeah. yeah. So then the local government, the Democratic Alliance, they're the second biggest party in the country, and they run the Western Cape. They they won that a few years ago, and they're you know they're the administrators there. So they started implementing water saving measures and and you know, installing me- uh, meters in people's houses to make sure that they, you okay. know, use, you know, the allotted amount and, yeah. you know, so a few fascist measures, but, you know, let's not, <laughs> we won't stray that far. Um, but I think it was a case of, it, there is a drought. Um, yeah. I'll say that much. There is a natural oh, element. Yeah, right. There is a natural element of it. It hasn't been the case that people, you know, necessarily did, just wasted water. Yeah. Um, but I think that the fact that, no one owned any resort, any water resources meant that nothing, no actions could be taken, nothing could be implemented. And now they they managed to delay day zero, which was, you know, the day that Cape Town's taps would run dry. That was supposed to be the, I think the end of April, but now it's been sort of postponed indefinitely. So you also wonder how dire it really was, whether that was just the local government sort of trying to scare people. Um, but for now, they're doing okay. I haven't been to Cape Town for a few months, but I know that when you go, you can only use certain you know, amounts of liters yeah. of water per day, and you have to take a two-minute shower. And I mean, for a, a huge tourist uh, city such as Cape Town, it's, it's very bad for, for the economy and for, sure. um, for jobs and growth and that sort of thing. So I, I think they're, they're managing the situation. I don't see a, a big resolution necessarily unless they start desalinization such as they did in uh, in Israel, uh, and we've we've touched on that as well. But a lot of um, I think a lot of people in South Africa, especially uh, academics, politicians, and students, are pro-Palestinian. So they've sort of told us don't follow the Israeli model because you know I've Israel, actually heard that Israel yeah. sent some delegations down with yeah. some office of technology desalination, other things, and nobody would even meet them because no. the the politics they are so left wing. Yeah. so anti-Israeli, so pro-Palestinian that they wouldn't even take a meeting. And, uh, and the Israelis have tried several times to offer technological solutions to the problem of South Africa. I mean, yeah. here's Israel, who goes through droughts all the time, and today has, a, has no water problem. They have, they, you know, they could probably, they, they could teach California a thing or two because they've used technology to eliminate nature as a variable, in a sense, right. to, to make sure that there's always enough enough water and yeah. um yeah but but cape town is gonna it's gonna be it's gonna be the, i think the first modern city to actually see yeah. water actually disappear from the taps a real, yeah. a real tragedy and again an issue of property rights it's the same issue with the, with the land confiscation the same reason i think there's poverty in south africa uh mm-hmm. you know it's a lack of property rights it's a lack of capitalism it's it's yeah. uh, it's the fact that uh you know, under apartheid, we had uh, we had uh, we had uh, statism, and, right. and since since uh, the ANC has been in power, we've had a you know the same kind of statism uh, with the socialism being worse. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's just tragic. Such a rich country that South yeah. Africa is, there's absolutely no reason for the the amount of poverty that exists there. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, South Africans are South Africans are used to sort of state control and state intervention so when you offer them an alternative such as objectivism they sort of stop and you know take a breath and they're surprised that there might be an alternative so in a way it's good because you so you shock the system yeah uh, no we, we need to you, shock you know. the system more absolutely we yeah. need we need to expose them to more free market ideas yeah. and and ideally to uh, to objectivism and let me just say because i was in south africa under apartheid that i thought it was awful i mean i yeah. you know, apartheid was disgusting it was it was ugly it was just horrible and and uh, uh you know i'm glad that's gone and and yeah. uh you know i've also on the show in the past praised nelson mandela not because mm-hmm. not as an economist and not as a as a purveyor of, of economic freedom but for transitioning south africa uh to democracy without 
uh, without violence, which, mm-hmm. which I would have expected. I would expect the place to explode. Yeah. And apartheid was so ugly. Uh, the, 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 the way the whites behaved under apartheid was so disgusting that you would have expected a violent response sure. to that. I think, I think Mandela gets a lot of credit for yeah. having a peaceful transition. So that's yeah. the one sense in which, uh, you know, I think in spite of the bad that's happening in South Africa today, I would take it over apartheid any day. Yeah. I think the ANC, they could actually tell a much better story about what they've achieved, you know, with more freedom in the country, but they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't credit freedom with the gains that we've made. It would be more a case, well, they've given it to people instead of people doing it for themselves. Well, that's right, because if they if they attributed it to freedom, people would say, well, we want more. You know, if it right. works so well, how come we don't have more? All right, Crystal, yeah. thanks a lot. Really appreciate your time. It's 2.30 in the morning in Johannesburg. So uh, go get some sleep. Uh, Thank you, Ron. Joining us today. Really Thank you. All right, we're going to take a quick commercial break and then we'll be back and I'll be talking about Ben Shapiro. <laughs> 